Ultimately, I'm confident that the Supreme Court uh, will not take what would be an unprecedented, extraordinary step of overturning uh, a law that was passed by uh, a strong majority of uh, a democratically elected Congress. And I, I just remind conservative commentators that for years what we've heard is the biggest problem on the bench was judicial activism or a lack of judicial restraint. That uh, an unelected uh, group of, of people would somehow overturn uh, uh, a duly constituted and, and passed uh, law. Uh, well, there's a, a good example, uh, and I'm pretty confident that this, uh, this court will recognize that uh, and not take that step. I'm sorry. Uh, you know, as I said, we are confident that uh, this will be over, uh, that, that this will be upheld. Uh, I'm confident that this will be upheld because it should be upheld. And again, that's not just my opinion. That's the opinion of uh, a whole lot of constitutional law professors and academics and judges uh, and lawyers. Uh, who've examined this law, even if they're not particularly sympathetic to uh, this particular piece of legislation or my presidency. That was President Obama as he spoke uh, right before the decision came down on um, Obamacare, which primarily came down on to his on his side. Now, to him, that was the right decision. To others, Everyone screamed about judicial activism. At the same time, certain decisions came down right around the same point, uh, dealing with things like immigration reform, and um, he was very upset and called the court judicially activist. So what is all of this about judicial activism, and why is that some kind of naughty word that you're supposed to say? It's really a, a dirty word in, in politics. Um, to understand judicial activism and to understand uh, where we are in terms of the role of the courts in government today, we're going to look here at um, our chapter 14, get a better, under, uh, get a better uh, idea of where these particular uh, concepts come into play and what Obama was talking about in that speech. All right, so the chapter 14 is the federal court system. That is the topic, and it's a very important topic. So what we're going to do is take a look at the, the role of the federal courts. We want to look at the nature of the judicial system itself. The structure of the federal uh, judicial system. The politics of judicial selection. The backgrounds of the judges and the justices who are selected to serve. The courts and their role as policymakers an understanding of the court system itself, and then we'll go through a brief summary. So let's start with an understanding of the nature of the judicial system. First of all, there are two kinds of law that are practiced. The first is criminal law. The criminal law is when the government charges an individual with violating a specific rule or law. And a criminal law is considered to be an offense offense against society Offense against society. Civil law is an offense against an individual. All right, one of those individuals may be the government itself, but basically, this is a dispute between two parties over a variety of matters. When you're talking about criminal law, you violated a statute. 
something that forbids a particular behavior or requires a behavior. And the only way that you get into criminal law is when a punishment, either jail or a fine, is attached. Now, litigants are the individuals who bring the charges. That would be the plaintiff and then your defendant. The plaintiff in a criminal case is always the state. Is always the state. The standing to sue means that you have to have a serious interest in the case, that it depends on whether you have sustained or are likely to sustain a direct and substantial injury. And this is particularly with regard to civil law. If you, do, if you are not going to uh, uh, sustain an injury or have not sustained an injury and can't prove it, you have no legal standing in a case. A class action suit is a lawsuit where you have uh, a number of people who sue on behalf of a very large number of people. So you have a small group suing on behalf of a larger group. And everybody who may be impacted in that larger group is the class uh, a, justice, a justiciable dispute uh, is an issue that is capable of being settled as a matter of law. If something is, is not being, is, is, if the courts can't give satisfaction, either through money or through uh, specific performance, making you do something or, re or forbidding you from doing something, then you don't have a just, justiciable dispute, one that can be decided by the justice system. An attorney, there are about a million attorneys who are practicing in the United States today. Access to attorneys has become more equal, but that does not mean that equality or that the quality of the representation is equal. In other words, if you use, the, um, uh, you use a criminal defense attorney who is provided by the state, he's going to have hundreds of cases, and he's more apt not to fight in your behalf but to plea deal plea bargain. And uh, so a lot of people feel that without money, it's very difficult to get justice. A group is a, seri uh, a, a class of people who are affected. A class action suit permits a small number of people to sue on behalf of a large number of people who are similarly situated. So if you have suffered, for instance, uh, your car uh, was recalled or wasn't recalled and they didn't tell you and there was an accident and it was a mechanical malfunction that they should have known about the manufacturer, uh, you and everybody who owned that car could sue as a class action. Now an amicus curiae is a friend of the court. Amicus curiae means friend of the court which is a brief which is filed for the purpose of influencing the decisions of the court. So this is somebody who doesn't have legal standing in the case, but wants to uh, chime in to get uh, especially an attorney or a group who wants to get their voice heard on a case. Now, this is little Linda Brown, right over here. And uh, she was outside, I'm oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. She's over here to the left. This is Linda Brown. Um... She was going to a segregated school in Little Rock, Arkansas, and her father uh, filed a lawsuit on her behalf saying that it was unfair that she had to walk to an all-black school when the, all -white, when the white school was just down the street. And so he said that separate but equal was not equal. And he sued and he won, which is the famous case of Brown versus the Board of Education. So this is Linda Brown, not this one. I am so sorry. Okay, uh, the structure of the federal system. You have your constitutional courts and your legislative courts. A constitutional court is created by Article 3 of the Judiciary Act of 1789. A legislative court is created by Article 1, and these are created for special purposes. The judges have fixed terms and lack protections against removal or salary reductions. So, um, in a constitutional court, which is one created in the Constitution, judges serve for life. 
in a legislative court, you can put a term on a judge, and uh, these would be things like bankruptcy and immigration courts. All right, so this is the organization of the court system. You have the Supreme Court at the top, which is the only one that is required by the Constitution. But the Constitution allows the Supreme Court to establish other inferior courts as may be necessary. The Supreme Courts, the Courts of Appeals, and the District Courts are all part of that federal court system. So you have your Supreme Court, your Courts of Appeals, and your District Courts. The legislative courts have specialized jurisdiction. So your, le your legislative courts are going to be uh, claims courts. Um, they're going to be um, immigration courts. They're going to be um, things like um, bankruptcy courts. So original jurisdiction is the jurisdiction of a court that hears the case first. Usually this is a trial court. Okay, so original jurisdictions are trial courts. These are ones that determine the facts, and these are the only ones that can de determine the facts. All right, so this is where the facts are heard. This is facts and testimony. This is the court record. This is the, the court record. You, hear, you have the transcript of the original jurisdiction court, the trial court, and that goes to the appellate court. So these courts hear cases on appeal from a lower court. They do not review. They do not review the factual record. There are three kinds of constitutional courts we're going to look at. Uh, district courts, courts of appeal, and the Supreme Court. There are 91 federal courts of original jurisdiction. These are your trial courts. They are the only federal courts in which a trial can be held and in which juries may be impaneled. There are 678 judges who preside over these cases. In rare cases, there is a three-judge court. Um, usually, though, the judges preside alone. Each court has between 2 and 28 judges, and the judges have to be randomly assigned. The jurisdiction of a district court is federal crimes, federal crimes, federal civil suits, Suits between citizens of different states, over $75,000. A bankruptcy proceeding, which we have special courts for. They review actions of some federal administrative agencies. They also can hear admiralty and maritime law cases. And they supervise naturalization of alien cases, which again is a special court. There were th more than 338,000 cases that were commenced in 2008 alone. Most of these cases are routine and few of them result in any kind of new policy or new law. When you have new law created through the judicial review process, this is where the accusation of judicial activism can come in. So usually judges in a trial court, in a district court, will not publish their decision. The loser in a case simply has to request an appeal and they will have one to the appellate court. Now, the Supreme Court doesn't work that way. They only hear the cases that they want to hear, and we'll talk about that in just a second. The Courts of Appeal are empowered to, powered to review all of the final decisions of the district courts, except in rare cases. They also can hear appeals for orders of many of the federal regulatory agencies. So about 75% of the 61,000 cases that are filed in courts of appeal come out of the district courts.
with the U.S. divided into 12 judicial districts, including one for the District of Columbia. Each of these districts or circuits serves at least two states and has between 6 and 28 permanent circuit judges, which makes 178 in all. This depends on the amount of judicial work in the circuit as to how many judges you get. And it used to be that judges in a courts of appeal would ride circuit. They would literally get on a horse and ride from place to place. Now, these courts of appeals are centered in different places. In Texas, we're in the 5th U.S. Court of Appeals, and that is headquartered out of New Orleans, Louisiana. Each court of appeal will normally hear a case on a rotating panel that consists of three judges. But if the case is so large that it requires everybody to listen to the case, it is what they call en banc, which means everybody. All judges are present in these important cases. Decisions in either arrangement will be made by a majority vote of the participating judges, so you have to have an odd number. So here's Texas in the Fifth Circuit. And this is a very conservative circuit. Whereas over here, the Ninth, whenever you see, and it's also Hawaii, whenever you see a, a liberal case, it's usually the Ninth Circuit. Sometimes it's the second, which is Vermont and New York, or the first, which is New Hampshire and Maine. But usually it's going to be, this is your conservative one. I'm sorry, this is your liberal. This is the liberal. And these guys right here, and these guys, and these guys are all conservative. Now, sometimes Florida can be a little bit on the liberal side, but usually they're conservative. All of these states are conservative. These two are liberal. And the ones in the middle generally tend to be moderate. All right. So, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit is composed of 12 judges that hear appeals in specialized cases. And these are things like patents, claims against the United States, and international trade. Um, they can, an, a court of appeal will correct an error. They're usually looking for an error in law or procedure. They also, they hold no trials. They only listen to arguments. They only listen to arguments. They hear no testimony. So there is no jury in a court of appeal. These decisions will what they call set precedent for all of the courts within their jurisdiction. Now when the Ninth Court of Appeals comes up with the more liberal ruling, for instance, gay marriage which would be the first and the ninth. What happened is, though, the fifth, which is what we're under, did not follow that because they're more conservative. So the Fifth Circuit, ours, tends to be more conservative and they don't follow the ninth or the first or the second New York. Okay, uh, Supreme Court. Top of judicial system is the Supreme Court. It has nine justices They are uh, who make decisions. They all listen to the case en banc. Okay, so that means they listen all together. They ensure uniformity interpreting the laws of the, of the nation. They resolve conflicts among the states and they maintain the national supremacy of law. They have both original, the both original and appellate. Most of theirs is appellate. So, original cases for the Supreme Court would it be anything involving a foreign diplomat or involving an argument with a state. The appellate jurisdiction, they will hear cases from U.S. Courts of Appeal, Court of Appeals for Federal Circuits, Legislative Courts, and State Courts of Last Resort, which is your, US, uh, your uh, Texas Supreme Court and Texas Court of Criminal Appeals, for instance. All right. 
Um, so the original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court is uh, arguments between states, uh, arguments between the state uh, between the U.S. and a state, between one state and the citizens of another state, or between a state and a foreign country. That's the original jurisdiction. Those are the only cases that go immediately to the Supreme Court. Their appellate just uh, jurisdiction through the federal route is through the U.S. Courts of Appeal, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, or the Legislative Courts. The appellate jurisdiction uh, through the state route would be the state courts of last resort, would be your state uh, Texas Supreme Court, or... Texas Court of Criminal Appeals. So, the next argument that we get into is how do we select judges. Remember, most judges at the federal level will serve um, for life. And that's important. When we select a Supreme Court justice, the president is making an impact on policy that will last far beyond that president who selects that person. Now, senatorial courtesy is that the district court nominee is usually not confirmed if it's opposed by a senator of the president's party from the state that the nominee will serve from. A courts of appeal nominee is not confirmed when opposed by a senator of the president's party who is from the nominee's state. Now, we have a very conservative group of senators, two senators here. Uh, particularly, um, the senator is the, that I am concerned about is Cruz. If you had a liberally nominated uh, judge coming from Texas that the president wanted to select, I can almost guarantee you that um, Senator Cruz would step in with his uh, senatorial courtesy and block that confirmation. And uh, the president has to get confirmation of someone in order for them to become a judge. Now, through th 2010, there have been 153 nominations to the Supreme Court. 112 of those have served on the court. 29 have failed to secure Senate confirmation. That means that the presidents have about an 80% success record, but lately it's getting harder to get someone uh, approved by the Senate to get onto the court because we've had mixed um, administrations where you have conservative members of Congress, especially at the Senate uh, level. If you have uh, conservative members of the Senate and you have liberal, a liberal president, you might have a problem. So these are unsuccessful uh, nominees since 1900. Uh, uh, Herbert Hoover wanted John Parker. Uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted Abe Fortas. Um, jo uh, Lyndon Johnson wanted a guy named Homer Home uh, Thornberry. Uh, Nixon wanted two people. One was uh, Clement Haynes Hainsworth and the other was Harold Carlswell. Uh, Reagan nominated Bork and Ginsburg. Ginsburg didn't get the vote because he had uh, he withdrew his nomination. He withdrew, uh, withdrew his consideration because he had it had been discovered that he had um, been smoking weed as a young law student, and that's why he didn't get it. Bork um, was too conservative for the um, uh, more liberal members of Congress, and even the moderates didn't want him, and so he was not elected. Harriet Myers is the funny one because she was basically uh, her her nomination was also withdrawn. She he she was the president's personal attorney, had no experience as a judge, had no experience as a professor in the law school, which is usually where these judges come from, had no experience, very little experience at trial, and she was his personal attorney, and he wanted to make her a member of the Supreme Court. And that didn't work out so good for President uh, Bush. Now, nominees are likely to run into trouble for several reasons. First, if the party is in the Senate minority, that's where you're going to have a problem. So right now, the majority of the Senate is Democrat. So it's very hard to block a nominee from a Democratic president in the democratically controlled Senate. 
However, uh, when you have a Democratic president and a, and a uh, conservative or Republican Senate, then you'd have a problem. Also, Republican president, conservative Senate. Um, when a president tries to make a nomination at the end of their term, a lame duck, that also is a problem. When the views are more distant from the norm in the Senate, the senators don't want to approve it. And when the nominee faces competence or ethics questions, which has happened. All right, background. Usually a federal judge is an attorney, but this is not, not a constitutional requirement. There have been federal judges who were not. Overwhelmingly, they're white, overwhelmingly, they're male, and overwhelmingly, they're rich. They have typically held office as a judge or prosecutor, and they have often been involved in, and this is where the trick comes in, partisan politics. Now, when you become a judge, it's not easy to put your partisan politics away when you know who, who brought you to office. There's an old saying that you dance with the ones that brung you, and meaning that if, if a president nominated you to the Supreme Court, then it's very likely that he's going to expect you to be with him on, on policy. According to um, the records now, all of the justices that we've had have been attorneys. All but six of them have been white men, and the six that aren't were Marshall, Thurgood Marshall, who was uh, African American, uh, O'Connor, who was the first woman, uh, Clarence Thomas, who was African American, Ginsburg, Sotomayor, and Kagan have all been women. Most uh, are between the ages of 50 and 60 when they take up the office, and they are from upper middle or upper class uh, backgrounds and usually Protestant, but that's changing. So these are the justices as of 2010. Uh, John Roberts is uh, the youngest. Actually, I'm sorry, Kagan is younger. Uh, Roberts was the youngest. Uh, uh, Roberts is your chief justice. He was appointed by George W. Bush, and he was confirmed in 2005. Antonin Scalia uh, 19, was born in 1936. He's from Reagan. Anthony Kennedy, Reagan. Um, Clarence Thomas, George H.W. Bush. Ruth Bader Ginsburg, Clinton, Stephen Breyer, Clinton, Samuel Alito, Bush, Sotomayor, Obama, and Elena Kagan, Obama. So let's look here. Conservative, conservative, relative, very conservative, moderate, very conservative, Liberal, liberal, conservative, liberal, liberal. So that's one, two, three, four. And then you have um, Roberts or Kennedy, who can be the deciding vote. And then it's usually five on the other side. So it's, a, it's generally a five to four. And so um, that's why we have problems sometimes is because we have um, uh, a relatively conservative court, but there are others that argue that it's nowhere near conservative enough. Then there are argues that, others that argue that it's very conservative and nowhere near as uh, liberal enough. And this is where we get into some uh, big issues. On So this is Sonia Sotomayor. And um, she was the first Hispanic American to serve in the Supreme Court. Comes from New York, Puerto Rican. Most of your federal justices have held high administrative or judicial positions. Most have had experience as a judge at the appellate level, and many have worked with the Justice Department as prosecutors. Some have held elective office but had no government experience or had no previous judicial experience. But it's rare. The issue of partisanship, though, 
is a big influence. Um, when you become a, a judge, can you really throw away your partisan beliefs, especially with the the idea that you dance with the one that brung you? Um, there are people that expect certain things. 13 of 112 members of the Supreme Court have been nominated by presidents of a different party. Only 13. 90 percent of the nominees are members of the president's party and again that's where you get into this issue of you were appointed for a particular purpose now let's think about sandra day o'connor who was appointed by ronald reagan and it was thought that she would be a conservative and she turned out to be a moderate she was the moderating voice on the supreme court when she was there and um, she oftentimes played the role in a five to four decision, she would be that fifth vote on either side. And it really, to her, didn't matter which side it was. She really believed that she had to be in the middle and making the right decision. So with her, she wasn't as partisan as it was thought that she would be when she was appointed. So a lot of Republicans were very disappointed that she was very part was was less partisan than they anticipated. Ideology influences judicial selection. Uh, Thirteen nominees shared the president's ideology but were not from the president's party. The president wants to appoint to the federal bench a person who shares his views because he wants policies that, that, that he agrees with and he wants to leave a legacy. And this is one of the most important decisions a president can make. They want to leave a legacy. Now, with the court in terms of policy... Uh, it's important to understand that um, the way that the courts accept their cases, the way they make decisions, the way they implement those decisions, and the way that the courts um, work with public policy are all very important aspects of the, the judicial system. The uh, Supreme Court is going to hear about 8,000 petitions or requests for what are called certiorari, which is uh, the request to hear the case. Um, they go into conference and they discuss which ones they're going to accept. There's generally something called a rule of four. 99% of the cases are denied. If four justices out of the nine will agree to hear the case, then the case is heard. It will be placed on the docket. Generally, in any year, there are fewer than 100 cases that are actually given a writ of certiorari. So, getting into the docket of the Supreme Court. You remember, you've got cases coming out of the federal courts and the state courts. Then you have your request for Supreme Court review. It's called a request for writ of certiorari. The appeals are discussed in conference. 99% of those are denied. If you get four votes out of the nine justices, then you can get placed on the docket, and that is generally fewer than 100 cases out of 8,000. Now, uh, the third ranking just, uh, Justice Department official is your Solicitor General. And he is in charge of the uh, court appeals that are made by the federal government. So it's he that's going to argue those appeals. It's he that's going to decide which ones are going to be appealed. He decides which cases to appeal, to review, or to modify. Uh, he represents the federal government before the Supreme Court, and he submits what are called amicus curiae, or friend of the court briefs. So your solicitor general is the, the attorney to the country, not the attorney general, as you might think. Briefs are submitted by both sides, and amicus curiae briefs are filed, which is your friend of the court. Then you have oral arguments. One hour are gen is generally allowed for oral arguments. Then the justices go into co uh, conference, and they discuss the case, and they vote, and then they will decide who's going to write the majority and the minority opinion. Opinions are drafted and circulated for comment, and then... At the end of, a, of the year, usually in the summer, you get your announcement of decisions. So, 
The case is on the docket. The briefs are submitted by both sides and you get amicus curiae briefs. Then you have oral documents, uh, oral arguments, one hour. Then you go to conference and discuss the case and they take a vote. And they, th these get very contentious. They get very contentious. They get very uh, heated. Then the opinions are drafted and circulated for comment and then the decision is announced. So an opinion is a statement of legal reasoning that is behind a decision that the justices make. The majority of opinion would be five or more of the justices. Dissenting opinions, any justice is opposed to the majority decision will write what is called a dissent. A concurring opinion is a su uh, supports a majority decision but stresses a different constitutional or legal basis. So they don't agree with the, with the explanation of the opinion but they agree with the opinion. So this is uh, Justice uh, Rehnquist, who's passed away now. Uh, the content of a Supreme Court opinion may be as important as the decision itself, and justices can spend many months negotiating a majority opinion. This is William Rehnquist uh, as he's going over a written opinion at the Supreme Court. Stare decisis. Let the decision stand is very important because basically it's a tradition in law. If a higher court makes a decision, then that decision should stand to all other courts that follow unless there's a reason why um, that decision should be changed. So this is called establishing precedent. This is how similar cases have been decided in the past. If you're going to set new precedent, that's where you get into judicial activism because now you're doing something different. The lower courts are expected to follow the precedence of the higher courts in their decisions, and that is the concept of stare decisis, or stand by your decision. Now, once your decision is made, it has to be implemented. Judicial implementation is how and whether a court decision is translated into actual policy. The courts rely on other governmental units to enforce a decision, and judicial implementation involves interpreting, implementing, uh, and consumer um, populations, which basically means um, going out there and seeing whether or not the public is even going to buy into the decision. Because some decisions, uh, I can think of a few, uh, like uh, um, the one dealing with... Uh, abortion, okay, um, that decision, Roe v. Wade, has been very uh, heated. And if you ask the majority of people, they would probably say they disagree with this decision. Uh, and the Republican Party has made it their goal to overturn this decision. We'll see how well that works. Until the Civil War, the dominant question before the court usually was concerned with slavery and the strength and legitimacy of the federal government, states' rights. And these were resolved in favor of the supremacy of the federal government, usually the supremacy clause. Now it, it becomes a little different. It's not just states' rights issues, although states' rights seems to be at the forefront. From the Civil War until 1937, the question was often the relationship between the federal government and the economy that predominated. So the court restricted the power of the federal government to regulate the economy um, using several rulings, especially in the 1930s when you had the court packing case uh, of FDR and you had FDR's alphabet soup of programs. After the 1930s, it has become personal liberties and social and political equity questions that have dominated the court. And this has uh, enlarged the scope uh, of personal freedom and civil rights, but it has also um, become uh, other people that are affected by these decisions don't like the fact that these constitutional restraints have been placed on um, the, the population and the states particularly. John Marshall was the Chief Justice from 1801 to 1835 and his most famous case would be Mar versus Marbury versus Madison of 1803. This was the first case where judicial review was established. And judicial review is the power of the court to determine whether an act of Congress 
or the president is in accord with the Constitution. Now we're looking at the courts and uh, democracy and the, and the scope of judicial power of the courts. Courts are not very democratic because judges are not elected and it's difficult to remove a judge because they serve for life. The courts often reflect popular majorities and preferences and the groups are likely to use uh, the courts when another method would fail and this promotes pluralism in the courts. But remember, people are appointed at different points in time and so you have this mixture of people from different uh, points of view. And so that's a good thing, but it can also be a bad thing, because they're expected to kind of follow the, the um, philosophy of those that had uh, led to their appointment. So interest groups will often use the judicial system to pursue their policy goals. For instance, some Hispanic parents have successfully sued local school districts to compel them to offer bilingual education, which is great. But then the question becomes, how is it going to be paid for? The courts don't establish that. They often establish unfunded mandates. Judicial restraint is the idea that a judge should play a minimal policy-making role and should follow the Constitution as written, word for word. Judicial activism is the idea that a judge should make a bold policy decision and even chart new constitutional ground on the basis of his decision, which basically means that the judge is making law. Uh, he's making new laws instead of enforcing or implementing the law or interpreting the law. A political question uh, becomes how courts avoid deciding some cases. Um, political questions basically if a court is going to answer a political question, then it has to take on itself some role uh, uh, in a partisan manner. So, for instance, it was the conservative part of the, court, the Supreme Court that upheld uh, or decided the, um, the fact that President Bush was going to become president in the 2000-year election because it was the Bush v. Gore decision, and Bush was ultimately anointed president by the Supreme Court. Statutory construction is when the courts interpret an act of Congress and decide whether or not they're going to establish new procedure, new law, or limit the, the, the um, scope of Congress. The vast majority of the cases that are, tr uh, are tried are going to be tried in state and not federal courts. And a court can only hear cases or controversies between plaintiffs and defendants. So you have to have standing to bring a case in front of the court. Plaintiffs have to have a standing to sue. And judges can only decide justiciable disputes. If it's a dispute that can't be solved with, uh, a problem that can't be solved with money or specific action, it's not justiciable. Attorneys can also play a central role in the judicial system. Their interest groups uh, will sometimes promote litigation and often file what are called amicus curiae or friend of the court briefs in cases that are brought by others. Circuit courts are going to hear appeals from the district courts and from any regulatory agencies. These are going to focus on correcting errors of procedure and errors of law. And, that, uh, and, and they can only hear... Rather than testimony, they can only hear arguments. They limit argument to a certain time period, and then they get briefs. Those briefs then tell them the law that they should be applying, and then they decide on their own what law to apply and to what way. The Supreme Court is at the top of the judicial system. It decides um, individual cases. It resolves conflicts among the states, it maintains national supremacy in the law, and it ensures uniformity in the interpretation of national laws. Most of the Supreme Court cases come from lower federal courts, but some are from appeal courts that are at the state level. These would be courts of last appeal at the state level, courts of last resort, and very few of them are what we call cases of original jurisdiction. 
To be a case of original jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, they, it has to be uh, involve a dispute with a state uh, or a dispute between uh, the United States and a state, a dispute between a state and another state, or a state and another individual in another state. Uh, the president nominates uh, judicial um, uh, nominees, uh, judges at the at the federal level, and the Senate will confirm those judges and justices. Senators play a very important role in the selection of lower court justices or judges as a result of senatorial courtesy, while the White House has more discretion with the Supreme Court. But the Senate confirms most judicial nominations, and it has rejected or refused to act in many in recent years, especially for positions in the higher courts. So the, the, the chances of getting through unscathed now are a lot harder than they used to be. Judges and justices are not a, represent sam a representative sample of the American people. They are all lawyers, and they are disproportionately white males of wealth. They usually have a partisan point of view, and they share ideological views with the president, regardless of whether or not they're in the same party, uh, though th they nominated them. You dance with the one that brung you. And these views are often reflected in their decisions. Other characteristics like race and gender are also seen to influence decisions, and this becomes important. Now, once the justices have written their opinions, once they've sat, they've heard the arguments, they get, they remember that the process, especially at the Supreme Court level, is that you apply for a writ of certiorari, and they don't have to accept all cases. So, in out of 8,000 petitions for a writ of certiorari, only about 100 are actually approved. The rule is that there needs to be a rule of four justices. Four justices have to, have to agree to hear the case for the case to get on the docket. Judicial implementation depends on the interpretation, judges and attorneys, the implementation, which are the other units of government that are going to carry out the law, and the consumer, those who are affected by decisions. Until the Civil War, the dominant question before the court was slavery and the strength and legitimacy of the federal government versus the states with the latter questions resolved in favor of the, the supremacy of the federal government. But, with the second phase, from the Civil War up till 1937, which generally dealt with the economy and the role of the government in regulating the economy, then we get to the third phase. From 1938 to the present, it's more progressivist. The key issues before the court have concerned personal liberty and social and political equality. The court has enlarged the scope of personal freedom and civil rights and has removed any of uh, many of the constitutional restraints on the regulation of the economy and that's that's a lot of the truth the federal government does not regulate the economy much at all and lastly judges and justices are not elected they are hard to remove they are not totally insulated from politics and they have promoted openness in the political system but they do serve for life and when you get one you're stuck with them they have a number of tools for avoiding making controversial decisions, and the President and Congress have a way uh, of over, uh, that they, they can use to try to overturn court decisions. And this is important, because uh, once a decision is made by the Supreme Court, it's very hard to get it overturned. The Supreme Court does not like to overturn itself. And so what happens is that you want to get those decisions uh, made in your favor at an earlier stage than the Supreme Court. And that is the end of this chapter.